Well, hello, everyone, to the fall holy days, the four fall final festivals of the Hebrew seventh month. The Hebrew seventh month usually fits into late September and October in our calendars today, in the Gregorian. And it's exciting. It's a very exciting time. The final four holy days in the seventh month. Seven is a number of finality, completion, perfection. But frankly, I don't think we, as God's children, who know about the holy days and the feasts of God and his appointed times to meet with him, frankly, are excited enough. If we could be like the Israelites having to go meet God at the foot of Mount Sinai and hear his voice and the trumpet and the lightning and the thunder, and if we knew that was going to be what we'd be going through, I think we'd be pretty excited. And we're going to be going through something even more exciting than anything like that very soon. But we're not as excited as we should be, including me. That's why I'm giving this teaching, to wake us all up, including me. So welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, host and founder of this free website. Remember to check out the short reads, the blogs, our sermons that are a mix of video sermons and audios. Uh, feel free to make comments, ask questions, and we hope you register as well. The more who have registered, uh, the better it, it works for us to get our message out. This will be a shorter message, but if you want to under understand the meaning of this uh, season, starting with Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, please check out the video sermon I just have on it that will explain in very good detail including some major differences in the teaching regarding timing that I feel God is leading more and more teachers and preachers to see. This is not my message today. It's not about Yom Teruah, the day of shouting. By the way, the Young's literal translation calls it a memorial of shouting. Anyway, we will see the return, I believe on this day, to the Mount of Olives, the return to the Mount of Olives by the Son of God, likely on this very day, with his wife that he's now married to. Hopefully that's you and me, the Israel of God, as Galatians 6 puts it. But time-wise, many of us understand we just cannot justify believing any longer that all of this happens on one literal earth day, that we're resurrected at the seventh trump on the Feast of Trumpets. Remember, uh, trumpets, silver trumpets and shofars were blown especially the silver trumpets, on all the holy days, all of them. It's hard to believe we're resurrected on this day, Feast of Trumpets. After the seventh trumpet, you see, there are still seven last plagues that are discussed in Revelation 15 and 16. And all of that happens after the seventh trump is blown. That surely takes months, maybe longer. And so for that reason alone, and then what are, what are we going to do? What is What and where and when will Jesus, will Yeshua, where would he be married on this devastated planet? No, so we believe, a lot of us believe, that the resurrection for the first fruits, the first ones to be resurrected are the first fruits, is on the day of first fruits, is on the feast of first fruits, which is Pentecost. That's also the day when God married Israel. And on the day of Pentecost, on that season anyway, at Mount Sinai. The days of unleavened bread mostly picture Yeshua, the first of the first fruits of lowly barley, and then the early converts. Pentecost itself is when two leavened loaves are lifted up towards heaven by the high priest as first fruits as Leviticus 23 says. The, these uh, two loaves are first fruits to God, it says. And I'll put the scriptures in the notes too. Anyway, so this pictures our ascension to heaven, I believe, to marry Jesus Christ, Yeshua our Messiah. Revelation 19 seems to be very clear to me when you read it. I heard another voice in heaven saying, and, and this I heard and saw in heaven. Heaven, heaven, heaven. 144,000 are seen in Revelation 14 on the sea of glass in heaven. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So we go up to heaven while the seven last plagues are being poured out 
get married, get introduced to our team, see the mansion that God has created that Yeshua has made for us, and then come back, I believe very likely, on the Feast of Trumpets. Yeshua said we won't know the day or the hour, and by then, there are verses I've covered before where it's prophesied that the earth will reel to and fro like a drunkard. And so, somewhere in all of that, it's, I think it's going to be hard to tell time. And, to, and, and, and with all the ash and volcanic ash and nuclear debris and warfare and everything else going on, it'll be hard to see the sun and the moon. And so it's very easy, very likely, that it'll be hard to tell. Are we in the first of the seventh month yet or not? But my point is this. Watch the video. I give all of that stuff in the video about the Feast of Trumpets. The day of shouting, Yom Teruah. But my point is this. Are we excited? Are we excited about the fall holy days? I've kept them all my life, pretty much, pretty privately as a child with my mom and siblings. And then openly in the Sabbath keeping church services I've attended since I was 12 when mom and dad divorced. <clears throat> that was 57 years ago. So this is no longer a new concept to me. And many of you fall into that category. You've kept this for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years or more like I have. And I realize when looking at our, my own attitude that I can preach about these days. I can discuss them. I can analyze them. But am I excited? In my real heart of hearts, am I excited? Carol made the point to me, my wife made the point to me, that so often we've emphasized events and doctrine, but we've often left out the person, the person of Jesus Christ. We haven't talked enough about him, Yeshua, the Messiah, the Savior. So we left out talking a lot about meeting him, getting married to him before this, the autumn festivals, then coming back with him as his bride, as his wife. And he's a very important someone, obviously the very son of God, who is also called God. And the word was God, John 1, 3, right? And he has invited you. God the Father called you, chose you. You chose him when you accepted the invitation, uh, he called you to be chosen. He called me to be present with him at his coming. We get so far excited about baseball games, football games, soccer games, then we do the coming of the Messiah. So that's what I'm talking about, getting that excitement back. The fall holy days, as far as we in the body of Christ are concerned, is about working with Yeshua, the Son of God. Jesus the Christ. Do you feel that excitement? Or are the fall holy days, if you're honest with yourself, a little bit ho-hum? The truth is sometimes it's hard to be excited over something you've done over and over again. Things you've been told mean that we're awful close, awful close, awful close, and then nothing happens as far as the return of Christ. We feel a little jaded. And I think that happens. The seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3 are warned about this very thing. The church at Ephesus was told, rekindle that first love. Don't lose that first love you had, that excitement. How come you don't close your eyes anymore when I kiss you? It's that kind of thing, you know. Uh, how come you're not excited about our wedding? And we need to wake up, he says, to the Sardis group the, at the sixth the, the fifth, the fifth church. You must wake up from your stupor, your spiritual stupor. You're almost dead. And we have to become zealous, hot on fire for our Messiah instead of lukewarm Laodicea. That's in Revelation 2 and 3. Yeshua, Jesus even asked if he would find on the earth any faith when he returns. Luke 18, 8. Here's why. I'm observing this lack of excitement, I think. I'm hearing about it. I'm noticing it. Oh, the Holy Day believers will go to church, will attend services. But is the thrill of what we're going there for 
And what we used to feel when we first heard about it, when all this was new to us, is that thrill still there? I think not. We have to be careful. Our, ch our children aren't bored by it either. Jews say this is the, uh, the Feast of Trumpets is the first day, they call it Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, and yet God told Israel in Exodus 12 that the first of the year now would be in the spring, in the month of Aviv. Jesus, I mean the Jews say this is the first day of, of the ten days of awe, a time of deep repentance, seeking after God, culminating in the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. It's not a bad idea for us as well to be using this time up to atonement to be praying extra, repenting extra as never before, asking our God and our Savior uh, to inject some real in excitement into us to help us get back that fervor. Now, I'm going to give a list of reasons why I think it's very possible that you and I have become a little jaded. Oh, we can talk very spiritual when we're talking to people. But in our hearts, are we really that excited? I think many of us are not. I am really trying to get that back. So why? Because whenever world news events popped up that seemed to indicate we were right there, really close to the return of Jesus Christ, and sparked some excitement over what seemed to be very end-time events, but we ended up not seeing Christ return. Over and over and over again that happened. And we didn't want to talk about the Lord delays His coming, even though in the parable of the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish virgins, when the bridegroom was delayed... So even Jesus himself says in his own parable that there would be a delay until there's a delay no longer. So let's look at some examples. I remember in the 1960s, uh, there was a rising strongman in Germany, some really believed could be the first beast power, head up the first beast power of Revelation 13. And now other people are mentioning another German, Gutenberg or somebody like that. But this first one, back in the 60s, he's long been dead since. I believe he's dead. He'd be certainly 100 years old or more by now if he wasn't dead. Then we finally saw the beginnings of what we now know as a, a European Union, the EU. And I think it started with six nations or whatever. Finally, finally there were ten. Were these the ten kings of Revelation? But then there were 11 and 12 and 15, and now there are 27 or more nations in the European Union. And now we just heard today that Ukraine wants again to be put in there so that they, all of Europe would have to basically start a World War III and defend Ukraine. And then United Kingdom exiting EU. Many of us have believed for a long time that England cannot be part of that peace power. It cannot be. So we got excited about that, but now it's stalled. And the Berlin Wall came down in November 1989. Germany was reunited. We got excited because we've all, many of us have believed Germany would be heading up that beast power in Europe. But Germany did not come on strongly. They're not as strong as they might seem, yet. And the Ukraine war did seem to awaken Europe, though. And we're starting to see it turn to the right. In Italy, that's happening with a lady named Georgia as a Maloney, I think it's her name. And then we saw the Soviet Union, October to December 1991, just fall apart. That was exciting. We tried to fit that into prophecy. What did that mean? And then the stock market crashed in 2008, really big time. I think something like 10% of the value was lost. Back then it was only 777 points. We've lost more than that now. But the impact now is not as strong as back then. Now, now it would be double that, I think, for us to uh, feel the same thing. <clears throat> but it caused a global financial crisis, spurred by the U.S. market subprime mortgage market crash. Surely this could lead to the end, but it did not. Many are watching the markets now in 2022. Just today, it fell another 500 points. We're now at $28,742. It was as high as 33000 something. So it's dropped 5,000 points. 2015, the Supreme Court said anybody could marry anybody. Gays, straights, anybody. Still, the end did not come. 
2017, in a Shemitah year, the USA moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. There were four peace accords with Arab nations in Israel the first time since Sadat. Was this the peace, peace, when there is no peace but sudden destruction? But it didn't happen. But still, the end didn't come. The 2020 riots, the complete chaos in the USA, cities burning down. That looked like the beginning of the end, but then 21 and 22 were not so bad compared to 2020, except for COVID. And COVID-19, which started in the end of 2019, that's why it's called COVID-19. The worldwide pandemic and how the executive orders of governors and prime ministers and presidents all around the world. And I believe it certainly set the stage for them all <clears throat> working together, same rules all around the world. You had to get these unproven vaccines. They weren't even vaccines in the traditional sense. Didn't stop you from getting the disease or getting it again and again or transmitting it. But still the end did not come. There were not more pandemics yet. And then we had in late 2020, the return in Washington, D.C., Jonathan Kahn. I was there. We went there with my friend Mike. Surely this repentance of scores of thousands, even millions around the world, would show our God our earnestness. But the only thing that happened on that day was the swearing in of Justice Amy Coney Barrett, Amy Coney Barrett, who allowed for the that allowed for the overturning of Roe v. Wade and abortion laws. But anyway. Still, we're waiting. Massive earthquakes around the world, tsunamis over the years. Still, the end did not come. The red moons of 2015, I meant to mention that. The Pope, right now as I speak, <clears throat> anyway, recently was meeting with world leaders of almost all religions in Kazakhstan, September 2022, including the top two rabbis of Israel, including the various Russian and Greek Orthodox leaders, many more. He wants one world religion. He said so. Made it clear. They talked about Chrislam, the rise of unity between the world's Christianity and Islam. Chrislam. And remember, Pope Francis in Kazakhstan seems friendly to Chrislam, seeming to be encouraged that this could start the potential one world religion that he mentions at the seventh meeting of the Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions, held September 14 and 15 in Kazakhstan. The Pope and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar of Al signed this preliminary joint agreement. In 2019, they traveled to Abu Dhabi to sign the global covenant called the Peace Covenant. Did you hear about that? The Document for Human Fraternity for World Peace is what it was called. 2019, the Document for the Human Fraternity for World Peace. And then in the UAE, they started, they've started building three buildings dedicated to Chrislam's headquarters, the Abrahamic Family House, consisting of the world religions tied to Abraham. So they have a Jewish synagogue, they have a beautiful Catholic church, and they have a beautiful Islamic mosque, and an educational center all working together. Just be aware of it. I'll put a picture in my notes of what it's supposed to look like when it's done. Very beautiful. <clears throat> We're told in Revelation 13, verses 7 and 8, I believe, that there will be one re world religion for all nations, tongues, languages. I believe we'll see them all worshiping and agreeing to worship God. That's what they'll call him, probably. However you understand God. But they won't allow the unique names for God. We have to say God as what I predict they'll do. Not prophesying, I'm just thinking out loud. We'll say God instead of Allah. We'll say God instead of Jesus. But you watch, Jesus, Yeshua, will not be allowed to be mentioned. But you and I must not be part of this one world religion, for you will incur the wrath of God himself if you do. It says so several times, especially in the book of Revelation 13, Revelation 13, uh, the end of Revelation 19, Revelation 17. <clears throat> 
So as these things, these things seemed to be taking their good old time, we became jaded, blasé, unexcited. So this message today is simple. Wake up, believers. Wake up, Philip. Wake up, America. What's your name? Put your name in there. Wake up. Use the next few days to repent. Seek God as never before. Spend more time on your knees. Go for your walk and talk with God around the block. Pray at your home. Pray outside your home. Pray always. Pray continually. Understand, it's been prophesied, there will be proclamations of peace and peace and peace. A time of safety, but no real peace. First Thessalonians 5.3 Like a pregnant woman giving birth, or about to give birth any time. But it, the baby never seems to come. Luke 21, 25 to 28, And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. Luke 21, verse 25, I'm reading, The sea and all the waves roaring. So God does speak about shaking the earth, maybe literally. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We might see near misses, maybe small asteroids. A large asteroid hitting the earth would probably wipe us all out. And then they will see the Son of Man, verse 27, Luke 21, verse 27, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Later on in Revelation 19, he's coming on a white charger. So it's two different comings. He comes to collect his bride, on the clouds, and then we're with him. The two leaven loaves are raised up, picturing us going to heaven for the wedding supper, just like he married Israel of God in Acts, I'm sorry, Exodus 19 to 24. Israel was the first fruits of the many nations. God would eventually call everyone, like we see in Zechariah 14. Israel was the first fruits. God married her on the first fruits day. God met with her on first fruits day. It's going to happen again on first fruits day, feast of first fruits, Pentecost. Now, when these things begin to happen, verse 28, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. The first time he came to Israel, remember even then uh, in Exodus 19, he was in a cloud in a dark, dark, cloud and fire and lightning and thunder and the uh, mountains shook. Uh, we used to sing that in one of our hymnals. When the mountains leaped like rams and the hills skipped like lambs out of the book of Psalms. So here's a major piece of advice. Quit being primarily ex excited about world news. Get excited more and more instead about your relationship with Yeshua and his return. Look to him not to world events. Look to him, not to world events. Don't let Satan distract you. We were just badly distracted by Hurricane Ian. And all of us in Florida were spending hours getting ready for it. I spent hours praying about it. We were emptying gas stations, building up our water supplies, putting plywood on the windows. God answered our prayers and I didn't lose a single flower. Not a single branch from a single tree. Not a single uh, tile from my roof. Nothing. God protected us. We did our part. We did prepare. Months ago we started. Just like Joseph did before the seven famine years. And most of all, our faith had to be in God. And it was. But don't let news distraction place you into positions of potentially feeling let down again. Let's learn from what we've gone through for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years. We are getting closer. It's time to get excited now about meeting someone. Not world events, but about meeting someone. Now, so I, I'm advising you to repent as never before. Stop sinful habits that you know aren't right. Now, pray constantly as never before. Praise God, Yeshua, as never before. Sing to him as never before. 
Bow your head down, down, down low to worship him. Make the spiritual be the focus of your life. Get excited again. <clears throat> so the last four holy days, in the seventh month, these picture the completion and perfection of God's plan of salvation, starting with Yom Teruah, day of shouting and blasts, the feast of trumpets. So I do believe we're resurrected at the last trump, the seventh trump, but that will, as I see it, from the from what happened before in Scripture, God gave his engagement ring, the Arabon, the earnest, the Arabon, the earnest of the Holy Spirit, the in the Greek, the word for engagement ring is arabona, with a letter A at the end of Without the A, it means earnest, your, your commitment. That was on Pentecost. He married Israel on Pentecost. Boaz and Ruth got married in the Pentecost season. But then we have, so, so, so we get married up in heaven. I really believe that. Seven last plagues, remember, have to happen after the seventh trump. In the traditional teaching, uh, we're changed on the seventh trump. We meet him in the air and then come and land on the Mount of Olives and take over. And everybody seems to forget, wait a minute, there are seven last plagues between the seventh trumpet and landing on the Mount of Olives. What are we doing all that time? I'm saying we're up in heaven getting married, getting introduced to our team we're going to be working with, seeing our home that Yeshua, Jesus, has built for me says we won't know the day or the hour. I think it's because of all the stuff in the air. It'd be hard to even know if there's a, a new moon. But whatever it is, the last trump will sound, the seventh trump, and on this day, I think at Pentecost, the bride and the saints of God will shout, Long live the King of Kings! Long live King Yeshua! That's what they did when Solomon was proclaimed king. When his older brother Adonijah first started to take claim of the throne. You can read that in 1 Kings 1. And in the end, <clears throat> David had King Shlomo, the Hebrew name for Solomon, and his entourage, and the faithful priests, and the faithful military leaders. Um, what was his name? Benaiah, I think, was his name. Uh, all go down and went down to the um, Gihon Springs and, and uh, proclaim him king. Carol and I reenacted that in 2009 with about 50 others at the very location that took place near the Kidron Valley in the pools of water anciently known as the Gihon Springs. Hezekiah's Tunnel connects the spring to the Pool of Siloam on the southern end of the city of David. When we got there, because that's where kings were crowned and proclaimed king, there we were, shouting, Long live the king! Not far from the Mount of Olives itself. Today we shout our praises <clears throat> to King Yeshua. My voice is tired, you guys. I hope you can put up with this, because uh, Ian kept us awake a while and uh, being prepared for it and all of that. But I wanted to get this out. Today we shout out our praises to King Yeshua as our Lord, our Master, as our King. Because even when he lands on the Mount of Olives, the world, the Jews who are still surviving at that point in Jerusalem will certainly be shouting their praises. It's a day of shouts. It's a day of screams for those fighting him as their bodies dissolve, as it says in Zechariah 14. Their very bodies, their eyes will dissolve in their eye sockets. Go back and read it. It must be, it should be a day of shouting, praising, celebration, acclamation, noise. So brothers and sisters in Yeshua, the fall festivals are not just simple holy days. I'll be giving the meaning of the days in the coming sermons. This sermon is, hey, let's get excited about it again. These days aren't really about me and you. It's really about our king and what he's going to do for the world now. It's now, it's now about the rest of the world being called to salvation. It's really about our king and what he's doing to remove Satan, who is the present-day god of this age. He's going to rush, uh, reign or bring in his own rulership. He will be the true god of this world. And Satan will be deposed, that we can read in Revelation 20. 
So I'm getting excited about these fall holy days, not so much because the Feast of Tabernacles is a fun time to go someplace you haven't been for a while. We're going to a beautiful place. Some of you are going to Cabo or or uh, some other beautiful place in Europe or, or Mexico or Central America or the Bahamas or something. So it's thrilling to get out and be with family. But I'm thrilled more about the fall feast, not because of that, but because they point to the beginning of the end of Satan's rule and the beginning with no end of our loving God. And he will eventually turn, Yeshua, Jesus, will turn that over to God the Father. We're told in 1 Corinthians 15, but of his kingdom there shall be no end. Praise the eternal. Praise our God the Father, our Abba, our dear Daddy, God Most High. Praise Jesus Christ, our Savior and Ruler. So I get excited about these fall holy days because they picture when the world will finally get to meet the true King of Kings, the true God of this world from that time on, the Son of God Himself. The fall holy days picture coming before God, letting the world come before God, letting the world experience Him, letting the world see Him come down. Every eye shall see Him. And they'll come to Jerusalem to worship Him at the Feast of Tabernacles. If they don't, they'll have no, no rain for as long as they stay away. Zechariah 14 is all about that. Read verses 16, 17, 18. Zechariah 14. So let's get and keep excited about all of that, can we? It's also about a time when people will finally be loved and cared for properly. I'm excited because torture will finally stop. That's going on today, every single day, somewhere in the world. I'm excited because families, godly families, will be restored. Families with a real father and a real mother, not just a birthing person, but a real mother who love the children, love each other. I'm excited because violence and wars will come to an end. The senseless and vicious death caused by wars will cease. I'm looking forward. I'm getting excited again for the time when leaders will care about the people they serve because those leaders are you and me as we watch the King of King lead by his example. These fall holy days picture God's plan for the whole world and for everybody in it. He's coming to save people from themselves, the world from themselves, save us from ourselves. He's coming to pull the dope addicts and the prostitutes off out of their miserable life and show them what real joy, real living can be like. He's coming to help us all be healthy in mind, body, and spirit. He's coming so we can hear laughter and joy everywhere we go. Come, Master, come. Help us get excited again and never lose it. We're very excited about what you're about to bring to the whole world. We're very excited about the prospect of working so closely with you as your bride, as your wife, as your companion for forever and ever, so we shall ever be with the Lord. Help awaken our love. Help awaken our excitement. Thank you, dear Master. Father in heaven, we come before you and we just ask in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name, that you will just rekindle those of us who need it rekindle this joy, this excitement, this love. Oh, we all go to church still on the holy days, at least the ones hearing this. But do we go with a sense of thrill and excitement? I don't know. I wish we would. Those of us who've been watching things for 40, 50, 60 years, I pray, Father, that you will let us understand we're closer than ever before. Pour out your anointing of the Holy Spirit on us. Pour out your excitement for it. Pour out your zeal for the work that has to be done still. We love you very much. Please protect us as we go to the feast. Please keep Satan's distractions from us focusing on the feast and what they mean. 
fall holy days. And if there are distractions, let us get through it quickly and come back to you. I'm talking about like hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and different things. Thank you so much, dear Father. We love you with all our heart. Thank you, Jesus. Master, please come. Father, please let him come soon. In Jesus' name, amen.